Welcome everyone. If you can use the chat function and let us know where you're joining us from, that would be great. We will start very shortly. I see we have folks from Denver, from Phoenix, Boston. A few folks from New York, New Orleans, welcome. San Antonio, Illinois, Chicago. Florida, welcome. I wonder what we have someone from Charlotte, my hometown. This is great. Central Texas, Maine, Fort Myers, Florida, Mississippi. Thanks for joining everyone. I love to see we have folks from all across the country, including Missouri, who just expanded Medicaid. Amazing. Great, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. And um, I'd like to first um, share a little bit about our panel. We'll have some housekeeping, but just as a reminder, this meeting will be recorded. So I'm going to do that or ask, um, actually I can do that. I'll do that now. It is being recorded already. Oh, wonderful, okay. So this meeting is being recorded. Welcome to the, uh, our panel discussion, our community health forum around the national study of social and structural drivers of COVID-19 diagnosis and deaths among Hispanic and Latinos. And today we're going to have a panel discussion with researchers uh, around a really timely and urgent need to assess the risk for COVID infection and death among Latinos in the US. Um, and we all know that Latinos, Hispanics have been disproportionately impacted by COVID. And, and so in many of our states, we are seeing rising cases, rising numbers due to, you know, where we work, um, where we live, geography matters. And so it is important that we assess county level data as well as information happening in our states. Um, And so just some quick housekeeping. Um, if you are not speaking, we ask that you do. Please mute your microphones and phones. Um, I believe everyone should be in listen only mode. Um, so you can please ask questions in our chat function in any, in Spanish or in English, we're happy to translate that. Um, and again, this meeting is being recorded. So thank you for joining us today. Now I'd like to introduce our panelists for this morning and I'll introduce all of our panelists and then they will share their screen with their presentations regarding the information. And so I'd like to welcome um, Dr. Carlos Rodriguez Diaz with the Department of Prevention and Community Health in, um, from George Washington University in Washington, DC. He's a community health scientist with over 15 years of experiencing practicing public health and conducting action research in Puerto Rico um, and in the United States and in the Caribbean region. His work has focused on infectious diseases, particularly HIV care and prevention, as well as sexual health promotion and equity through actions on social determinants of health. I'd also like to welcome Melissa Marzan Rodriguez, Dr. Melissa Marzan Rodriguez um, with Ponce Health Sciences University from Ponce, Puerto Rico. Dr. Melissa Marzan has been an assistant researcher and conducted research in the areas of HIV, AIDS, STD, stigma, and health in teens at the University of Puerto Rico. Um, she was also the principal investigator of MECA, Evaluando Actitudes Estigmatizantes project. She has experience as a field epidemiologist, having been a field director in the AIDS PAC surveillance project of the Health Department of Puerto Rico, and an epidemiologist um, as well. We also have Jeffrey Crowley from the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health at Georgetown University, 
Professor Crowley is a widely recognized expert on HIV and AIDS and disability policy. Uh, from February 2009 through December 2011, he served as the director of the White House Office of National AIDS Policy and Senior Advisor on Disability Policy for President Barack Obama. In this capacity, he led the development of our country's first domestic national HIV AIDS strategy for the US, a five-year plan for aligning the efforts of all stakeholders to reduce the number of new HIV infections, increase access to care, and reduce HIV health related disparities. And then we have Gregorio Millet from the Foundation for AIDS Research, AMFAR. Gregorio Millet is a well-published and nationally recognized epidemiologist researcher with significant experience working at the highest levels of federal HIV policy development at both the White House and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Prior to joining AMFAR in May 2014, Mr. Millet served as the HHS CDC liaison to the White House Office of National AIDS Policy. Dr. Millet has been credited with changing the underlying assumptions among researchers of observed HIV infection disparities among Black men who have sex with men and is widely recognized as one of the first researchers to show no protective effect associated with male circumcision for MSM. So I will turn it over to Dr. Rodriguez and I'll stop sharing my screen. Carla, you can share your screen now. So welcome, Dr. Okay, sorry, I guess you can see my screen now. Awesome. Well, first of all, thank you for um, attending this important meeting. Um, we are thrilled that we have this opportunity to share the findings from our study with uh, our community and those serving our Latino communities here in the United States. I also want to thank the Latino Commission on AIDS and the health, um, the, the Hispanic Health Network um, that facilitated uh, organizing this event. Um, in terms of the agenda for today, we will share several slides with you based on our research study and other related um, information that we understand is it's ideal to have a discussion. Uh, but most of the time we would like to engage with you um, through the chat and answer questions and make sure that the research that we conducted is useful to our communities. The purpose of our research was not only to highlight structural drivers of the pandemic among Latinos in the United States, but to make sure that we came up with findings that are useful to make changes um, and have a positive impact in the health of our communities. So uh, as we've been already introduced, um, I want to thank my colleagues who are with me on the call. They are part of the co-authors of the work that we published um, two weeks ago. Uh, we also published with other colleagues from several academic institutions, including Puerto Rico and um, here in the continental US. So let's start um, with some of the work that we've done and um, hopefully setting the ground for the discussion we can have later. So probably during the last few weeks, you've seen some attention plays um, on the pandemic in Latino communities. These are some headlines that have been published in the last seven days. Um, the attention to disparities in the Latino communities have been uh, part of the discussion in the pandemic since very early, because unfortunately, um, there were disparities there in our Latino communities that the pandemic is just highlighting. And for those of you engaged in doing work with Latino communities, you clearly understand this. But do not underestimate the importance of the discussion that we're having and how we're framing that discussion 
because the issue of health disparities is not obvious for the overall population in the United States. And that is part and upfront in the discussion of the COVID pandemic. So we have a great opportunity, um, not only to highlight the health disparities that have been affected our communities historically and now during the pandemic, but also to engage in a conversation about how these disparities are really having a negative impact in the well-being of our communities and how we can address those that for the most part are through policy changes. So we have a great opportunity to respond to the emergency and change the negative impact that the pandemic is having among Latinos, but also to make a change or make changes that can have a durable impact in Latino communities. Our study was um, in part uh, developed because of our uh, historic involvement in health disparities, as uh, mentioned in the introduction, many of us have worked in the HIV field for decades, and the knowledge that we have gained um, in health disparities and HIV in the Latino communities was very transferable and useful these days. So we were called to do something, and here we are uh, trying to contribute to our community. I have to um, thank uh, Greg Millet, who uh, sparked the attention um, in the impact of the pandemic in communities of color. And he would briefly share with all of us uh, the work that he's been doing um, since very early in the pandemic. And then after a study that he led with um, African-American black communities, we were called to join efforts and do a similar work with Latino communities. And that's where we started working. In terms of the methods of the study, I'm not gonna get into all the details because it's very complex. Um, however, we developed a model that was basically following the work that um, Greg and colleagues published a month or so before our study, uh, addressing the differential impact of the COVID pandemic on black communities. That work is now published also in Annals of uh, Epidemiology and has been widely discussed at the national and international level because highlighted how the pandemic was affecting uh, Black communities in the United States. And because of the successful approach uh, in terms of the methodology um, they use, we model our study after the, the design that they um, use. However, um, we also included the heterogeneity or the differences in the Latino populations. We know that not all Latinos in the United States share uh, one unique story. We know that we have different ways of um, migration. Uh, we have people who speak different languages, Spanish or English for the most part. Um, they are geographically located in different places. They have experienced the migration in different ways. So all those elements were considered um, in the way we approach the data. And because for national purposes, Puerto Rico represents a significant portion of Latinos, we also included Puerto Rico in our study. Sorry. In terms of the data that we use, we were very consistent with the data that was used for the study with Black Americans. Um, we use USA Facts for uh, all the COVID-related data. The cutoff point for the data in our study was May 11th, and that was a uh, date that we um, chose because that was when most states started to relax the stay-at-home uh, policies, and we knew at that time that once those policies were relaxed, um, many things would happen. So uh, please, uh, take into account that all the data that we use was from the beginning of the pandemic all the way to May and does not reflect what has been going on in the last two or three months. Um, but however, unfortunately, what we are seeing is a repetition of those issues that were affecting our Latino communities early in the epidemic, just being highlighted in the negative impact of the pandemic now. For country level data, county level data, I should say, uh, we use the census um, data from the community survey and we selected several demographic characteristics that are included here uh, on the slide. We use data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics for employment. 
um, data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, um, mostly to describe um, chronic conditions that um, have been associated to uh, disease progression among those who get infected with COVID. We also use CDC data uh, for HIV, but we supplemented that with ACE view data. We use ONACAST to describe air pollution. And finally, data from the US Department of Agriculture to um, describe urbanicity. Our study is not at the individual level. And what that means is that we were not looking at comparing individuals with individuals. We were comparing counties. And we make this decision because it's the most specific data point that we can use to um, conduct reliable analysis, but also because it's useful for decision making. We can make decisions uh, in the context of the United States at the county level to protect uh, the health of the citizens. But using county level data also help at the state level and at the national level for decision making. Overall, um, we use an average of the percentage of Latinos uh, in the United States to make a cutoff or of predominantly Latino counties and those who were um, not predominantly Latino counties. And the cutoff point was 17.8. So anything that was 17.8 or any county that had 17.8% or more Latinos was considered in our study a predominantly Latino county. Um, and those predominantly Latino counties had uh, or shared these characteristics and these are statistically significant. Um, these counties had people that were uh, younger than other counties, more likely to lack health insurance, had a greater number of persons per room in a household, had fewer monolingual English-speaking Latino residents, and had a greater proportion of monolingual Spanish-speaking or bilingual citizens. So no surprise, for those of us who are in the field conducting work, providing services to Latinos, this is the profile that we see very often. Um, we address and assess the differences in health conditions like diabetes, cardiovascular conditions, and HIV, but we, we couldn't find any um, significant difference between predominantly Latino counties and other counties. So let's start sharing some of the results. So this map that I'm sharing here is not part of the results, but I want to share it um, so you have a reference of the distribution of Latinos in the U.S. This is by, um, data from 2017. And by the way, I am using Latinos, um, but I'm inclusive of different identities within our community. Latinos, Latinas, Latinx. Um, for the purposes of making the conversation easier, I'm using Latinos, but I want to acknowledge uh, different ways in which um, people identify. Um, here, uh, we can see the distribution of uh, Latinos in the United States. As you can see, the darker the color, the higher the concentration of uh, Latinos or Hispanics in the United States. In our study, we identified that COVID diagnosis rate were greater in Latino counties nationally by 90 cases per, per uh, 100,000 people. We also analyze cases and the distribution so in the second map, in the, uh, what would be the second in this uh, column on your right, this is the percentage of uh, Latino counties. The, and the darker the color, the, in, the higher the diagnosis of COVID. And probably you can see the overlap. So this is very consistent uh, with national data and what we are seeing here in our study of cases in regions where we have more Latinos. And we did a similar analysis with deaths. And here you can see, again, this is the same map with Latinos in the United States. These are the distribution of deaths in um, non-predominantly uh, Latino communities. And these are deaths in predominantly Latino communities in the United States. At the time that we, that we use data for our analysis, um, this is the first three months of the pandemic, you might recall that most of the cases were being reported in the Northeast, particularly in the Northeast Metropolitan Corridor, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. So we did a similar analysis to identify COVID deaths 
um, and diagnosis uh, in Latino communities. And this is what we found. Similarly, um, most um, Hispanic um, Latino counties in that region were disproportionately affected by cases and deaths. And this, uh, this illustration shows how the Northeast and the Midwest regions um, had the rates of COVID-19 cases that were higher in counties with a higher proportion of Latinos. So to read this graph, the number here is uh, COVID diagnosis per 100 uh, cases since detection. And then here we have the percentage of Latinos. And you can see here in the Midwest how, you, um, how we have a tendency of an increase over time, um, per, sorry, um, over percentage of Latinos per county and something similar in the Northeast. In the South, we almost have a flat line here and we will go over this later on. Um, again, this is the beginning of the pandemic and also consider other issues related with accessing to testing, the registry of the cases and how some data was not being collected early in the, in the pandemic. And then something similar with the West region uh, where we have a flat line, but here we were already seeing a tendency to go up. So in terms of COVID cases, what do we learn from our study about infections of uh, COVID in our Latino communities? First, the Northeast and the Midwest regions, the rates were higher in counties with higher proportion of Latinos, meaning um, Latinos in the Northeast and Midwest were disproportionately affected by the pandemic early um, in this year. But COVID cases were also graded in Latino communities in the United States overall, where we had more Latinos that were monolingual Spanish speakers. No surprise. We unfortunately know that for monolingual Spanish to have access to prevention information and to engage properly with, healthcare, with the healthcare system is much more difficult. We also found more COVID cases of our, among those with lower unemployment rates. And this is interesting because lower unemployment rates means that <clears throat> unemployments were, were um, lower or that em employment rates were slightly higher. Right, But consider this as we move forward to um, deaths. Here, what we are seeing is that the, the, the cases are more common among Latinos that are working. That's what it means. Latinos that are uh, working and couldn't stay at home um, to prevent uh, infections. Um, we also see so, uh, higher um, cases of higher rates of uh, COVID cases among those with history of heart disease uh, or counties that had a disproportionate high rates of um, heart disease. We also identify more cases in counties where it, uh, it was uh, reported less social distancing. And we also identify uh, more cases among Latino counties that had um, similar demographic and comorbidities and they were two times uh, more likely to have cases than other counties. And that what it means is that it was moving fast and the infections and it was uh, almost doubling um, when we compared baseline and the third quartile um, in our analysis. In terms of COVID deaths, the deaths in, among Latinos were higher uh, sorry, where the death rates were greater in the Midwestern counties and also among counties with crowded living conditions. And this is um, due to people who live in multi multifamily households and they have to come in and out uh, for work, but also have less space to uh, physically distance even within their household. Elevated air pollution was associated with um, COVID death rates among Latino counties, in Latino counties. And um, unfortunately, this is a trend that is comparable to other issues that we have discussed in environmental justice and how communities of color are disproportionately affected by environmental pollution. 
Um, and finally, as previously mentioned, COVID deaths were also um, greater in um, Latino counties that reported more Latinos that were working. And that is consistent with information that we know from the United States uh, that reports that most Latinos uh, couldn't stay at home uh, during the stay at home orders. They had to go out and work because they are frontline workers and they are um, working in industry, some of which were considered as essential industry like the meat packing and poultry processing um, industries. Um, we also found out that COVID-19 deaths were lower in Latino counties with higher proportion of persons 35 years of age or younger. And we know that younger age could be considered a pro protective factor, mostly because um, it is expected that younger uh, people have less uh, pre-existing conditions. However, again, this is early in the pandemic. That might be changing now. Uh, in terms of the people who are getting infected and are dying from COVID. And also um, COVID deaths were lower among high level of unemployment, higher levels of unemployment. And that is consistent with our hypothesis of the occupational exposure uh, among Latinos. Um, I'm gonna wrap up now um, the findings from our study, but I want to highlight um, some limitations and um, present some uh, of the issues that are gonna be discussed by my colleagues next. First, our methodology we know is not ideal, but it's very practical. Um, and we use a methodology that is very um, sounding, sounding, is consistent with good practices in epidemiology and biostatistics, but we hope we had better data. One of the challenges that we had was the quality of the data that we had. Um, and we know that that was a limitation and we acknowledge that. However, our analysis is also very consistent with the way the um, federal government had been using data to make decisions or some of the agencies have tried um, to uh, illustrate with scientific findings the kind of decisions that are needed. Um, also, we acknowledge that the association with county level it does, does not necessarily reflect association at the individual level. So for that, we um, understand that we had a limitation, but it's again, very consistent with the purpose of our study. Um, we know that in order to have data about COVID in Latinos, we need to have some Latinos testing and getting access to care. And that's an important challenge in our community. And we acknowledge that in the data that we use for our well analysis. Um, we also acknowledge that we have some challenges in characterizing the nuances of the COVID epidemic in Puerto Rico. And that's why um, our colleague Melissa is going to go briefly on how things are looking in Puerto Rico. Um, and again, our results are subject to a specific uh, time frame, and that has been changing. Uh, however, a good picture of what happened early in the epidemic could be extremely useful now that we need to make decisions, otherwise we would not see a solution soon uh, in terms of the increasing rates of new infections and deaths. So finally, some of the conclusions that we will continue discussing, mostly because of uh, the policy uh, nature of our conclusions. First, we have demonstrated that not all Latinos are equal. And for those of us that are part of the community of those of you that have been working with the community for years, you would know this. But again, I think that there are, there are many assumptions and there are several discourses um, in our country that make it harder to communicate challenges in our communities. And I hope that these studies serve to document challenges and the nuances uh, in the experience of Latino communities in the United States. Um, and because of that, we also know that we need policy changes, but the policy response cannot be um, the same for all counties, all communities, and assuming that all communities, communities of color or, uh, or other communities are equally affected um, by the implementations of certain policies. We also know that um, we need to implement timely assessment and interventions for infection control and prevention, prevention sorry, in particular to address the intersection of occupational risk and employment. 
we are okay with people staying at work and working or feeling productive and in fact getting an income based on, on, on their work. However, we need to provide the best conditions possible to prevent infection at, at work. And finally, we are encouraging to use uh, grassroots initiatives and community knowledge in the response to the pandemic. This cannot come from up and just use um, any strategy um, by not acknowledging the differences, but the built knowledge that we have in our communities on how to address our needs. And now um, I invite my colleague, Melissa Marsan Rodriguez, to um, tell us a little bit more of what's going on in the pandemic in Puerto Rico. Hi, good, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Carlos, and thank you to all the people that make possible this is space for discussion about Latino population and communities. So as Carlos mentioned, my name is Melissa Marzan Rodriguez, and I'm, I'm a Puerto Rican, and I'm living in Puerto Rico, and I have been involved with um, local COVID response from an academia perspective. And if you are familiar with Puerto Rico issues, you may know that 98.9% of people in Puerto Rico identify as a Hispanic or Latino, right? So when we talk about the impact of COVID-19 among Hispanic or Latino, it is important to contextualize the data according to the Puerto Rico challenges. Some of my colleagues in the academia consider Puerto Rico itself as a health disparity case study. I'm agree with them. Um, sometimes, because we are facing so many challenges in terms of the structural challenges over the last decade. COVID-19 just exacerbate all those daily challenges. Most of them are very related to the, our economic situation. So briefly, I will share with you an epidemiological overview of COVID-19 here in Puerto Rico. So next slide, please, Carlos. So here, currently we have almost 20,000 confirmed and probable cases since March 2020 that we um, reported our first case here in Puerto Rico. And as you can see, using preliminary data, and this is very important to highlight because we are facing so many challenges in terms of having um, real-time data. So in terms of preliminary data from the Puerto Rico Department of Health, the case incidents um, per 100,000 people over the last month is in the orange area, which means that 10 to 25 cases per 100,000 people have been reported over the, the last month. And it could be possible that once new data is integrated in the surveillance system, we can be very close to the red area which means a state at home orders are necessary again. And this is very important because as you may, may know, we have uh, one, one lockdown at the very early of the epidemic here in Puerto Rico for a month and a half. And then we start this reopening the, the, the economy since, um, since May. So now we are now seeing this research of cases and we are very um, look at this data and have all this information because we need to know we, where we are right now. So next slide, please, Carlos. In terms of hospitalization as a epidemiological indicator for COVID-19, today we have 507 cases who are in a hospital. So according to the EPI forecast um, developed by Dr. Becerra, this number is below the expected by today. So as you can see here, so we are expecting to be more likely to the 700 cases by, by, by today, but right now we are only in the 500 cases. But one important um, thing here, it's more that the number is that the, the trend is to increase the hospitalizations. So next slide, please, Carlos. 
So one of the things that I would like to share with you um, today is like this um, community syndromic surveillance system that we developed here in Puerto Rico since March. So very early in the, in the local epidemic here in Puerto Rico, we developed a syndromic surveillance system and this syndromic surveillance system is not like the traditional ones that um, collecting data from the ER. So basically we create this syndromic surveillance data using community information. So basically this is one of the adaptations that we need to, to, to do in order to have some information about what we happen in Puerto Rico regarding COVID-19. Next slide, please, Carlos. So here is a map of Puerto Rico, including Vieques and Culebra in your right. Um, and this is important because once people enter to our link, so they can complete the community survey, it's an anonymous survey. People spend like two, three minutes to complete the survey. And with the data that we um, ask, that is basically social demographic information, and we look for the signs and symptoms associated to COVID-19 in the last 24 hours. So once we have uh, the information, so basically we are using this um, platform to visualize the information using um, heat maps. And basically, as you can see, when areas are more in yellow or red, um, the information that we are gathering from those places is that more people are reporting to have fever or cough, for example. So next slide, please, Carlos. We also collect um, data from the indicators regarding um, mental health. So in a specific, we are just doing preliminary analysis right now with the information we have. But basically when we see um, economic, socioeconomic status, um, we are look also anxiety. So people serve reporter if they Fell, um, and anxious in the last week. So as you can see here, so basically we can see a difference between those who are from the uh, lower economic social status here in Puerto Rico, those who receive, I, I think that we can use this to um, first um, level, those who are under $25,000 annually, they are reported to feel more anxious than those who are from the others, high socioeconomical levels. So I think this is a, a, an information that once again is an evidence that how these social determinants of health are exacerbating um, issues related to COVID-19. So next slide please, Carlos. And um, finally, um, this is also preliminary data as well, but here is uh, the breaking down in terms of the socioeconomic status and how people, how much people are practicing social distancing. And it's very interesting because even no matter if you are from the low socioeconomic status or those who are from the highest, most of the people are doing a lot of social distancing in Puerto Rico. And I think this is a very good thing to highlight because I think um, Latino community could be more likely to, for example, wear a mask in public places. So that's a thing that is very important in terms of when we are looking for develop um, educational intervention. This is something that we can um, address in, in that intervention. So next slide, please, Carlos. Okay, so that's the, my, my brief for, from Puerto Rico. I'm available for question and answer at the end of the session. So now I'm going to introduce Rick Millet. Thank you so much and good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Um, let me see if I can go ahead and share my screen. So it really was a privilege to be a part of this um, 
this initiative uh, and, and this analysis, and, and particularly to uh, see Carlos really just do an incredible job in uncovering data that really up until this point has not been part of the conversation in the national media. Um, I'm going to uh, take up a little bit of what Melissa had mentioned beforehand. I mean, she really discussed the issue of social determinants of health that's placing black and brown communities at risk for COVID-19. And I really just want to put a quick finer point on that. Uh, Carlos had mentioned the paper that we published right before this using exactly the same technique, techniques of U.S. counties. Um, and, um, you know, we found that the black counties represented only 22% of counties, but they were 52% of COVID-19 diagnoses and 58% of COVID deaths. One of the things though that did not really make it into the media as much though, was just like what Carlos had mentioned beforehand when we looked at um, primarily Latino counties, that underlying health conditions did not explain the disparities that we were seeing in COVID-19 cases or deaths. Uh, what we found was that healthcare access, number of people in shared housing, and unemployment were all associated with COVID-19 diagnoses in our paper for Black Americans, and it was a lot of the same things that we saw in the COVID-19 paper for uh, Latinx populations. And really just to show what this really means, when you take a look at the maps that we have for Black Americans, you can see that underlying health conditions are elevated in um, uh, for heart disease as well as diabetes, which is associated with COVID-19. In the Southern US, this is where 55% of uh, Black Americans live. Um, but that's not really the big story. The big story is the social determinants of health within those same counties. So it's poverty, it's unemployment, it's uninsurance. Those are the main issues that are driving not only COVID-19, but also driving HIV in these counties that are primarily counties where Black Americans live. And it's exactly the same story that's happening in the Latinx counties. Now, many of you have uh, noticed that, um, you know, since the country has been reopening, that we're seeing this surge in cases that's taking place. And as Carlos had mentioned, uh, the data that we had for our paper goes until May 15th, but we are actually tracking um, on our own dashboard what the, what's taking place with Latinx counties in the U.S. in real time. And you could see that from May 15th till now, in specific states in the U.S., we're seeing an increase in um, COVID-19 cases much higher in Latinx counties. So you could see it for California, you could see it for Florida, you could see exactly the same thing for Texas. And that's also what's taking place nationally, that in the red trend lines, those are the Latinx counties, we're seeing much higher COVID-19 cases and a much sharper slope in diagnoses um, since the reopening of the United States. So it's very clear that COVID-19 is not affecting all communities equally. It's far more affecting communities of color. And this is just a quick show of the database that we built uh, for people to go ahead and see what's taking place in communities of color. Uh, we have data on uh, Latinx populations, Black Americans, um, as well as um, white Americans. And we do this all by county level. This is just a quick um, preview and a video that shows um, the black counties in the US um, where we're seeing COVID cases as well as deaths. Um, it gives quite a bit of information just going through today and by the end of the video, it gives you an accounting of how many COVID cases and deaths are in these black counties and we have the same for Latinx counties. Uh, this is a map um, that we have that has many different indicators for COVID. All of this is real-time data. It's downloaded daily. Right now you're looking at the map for black populations. You could see that when you click on any county, it gives you information on COVID cases and the percentage of blacks in that county. We do the same thing with um, Latinx populations. Uh, when you go down, you can see you can click on any county and it gives you the county name and proportion of COVID cases in that county as well as proportion Latinx. It gives you the COVID-19 cases and what is looking like for Latinx populations that you can see on the right hand side. And that right there is a map for white American and white American counties. But if you just look at Latinx for right now, you can click and go further and you can zoom in on South Florida and some of these specific counties. And on the right hand side, you can see that there are changes that show you what's COVID-19 cases and deaths within those Latinx counties. And as you keep scrolling down, it gives you additional information on um, the proportion of Latinx counties in the US, as well as a lot of the information that Carlos had shared. Um, but these are data that are now going through today uh, that's showing in the red uh, where Latinx counties are in terms of diagnoses by the Midwest, Northeast, South, as well as the West. 
Now, if you wanted to standardize these data, you can change the axes on this so that the data are standardized across each region of the US and you can compare it to see what is taking place with COVID-19. And we also have testing data. So for those places that are testing in the Midwest, Northeast, et cetera, you can see in the Midwest that as tests increase, the number of COVID cases go down. Um, but when you take a look at the West, we're seeing an increase in tests, but we're also seeing an increase in COVID cases, which means that um, unfortunately the uh, epidemic is out of control in the West Western U.S. as well as in the Southern U.S. So that's just a brief um, discussion of what we have that's available. Um, all of that is free. It's on the AMFAR website um, and it has uh, specific information uh, for uh, the dashboard for COVID-19. There are also data on that dashboard for EHE and ending the HIV epidemic and we actually have data on there as well, not only for Latinx populations, but we also have data on there for deportations and um, uh, immigration um, 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 arrests um, in specific counties in the U.S. and look at that for COVID-19 as well as HIV, just to give additional context. Um, that's some of my specific information. Um, and then from there, I just want to go ahead and introduce um, Jeffrey Crowley, who's going to discuss some of our policy implications. Jeff? Thank you, Greg. And uh, I just want to begin and, and uh, say it has been a, a great privilege to be part of this team working on this paper. I'm um, working with Carlos and Greg and, and Melissa and, and the other others on the team. I'm going to be relatively brief and I um, just want to talk about how I think we should think about this study and what's going on from a policy lens, but I'm not planning to tell you all the policies we need to talk about. That really wasn't the purpose of, of what, what, what we did here. Hopefully though, what you'll hear coming out of my remarks and really this whole discussion is a call to action because we all need to collectively work together to, to go from, from these results to, to making some changes. Now, I think we all can recognize that this is a challenging time for our country. And then the, um, the COVID-19 pandemic comes along. It's an it's a, uh, um, unprecedented challenge, not only for the United States, but for the, for the global community. And of course, we know that um, so many people are struggling. It can just be too much. So then to ask us, how do we think strategically about how we support Latinos, it can, can be too much. And so I just wanna um, suggest some ways we could think about what we do with this information. I think that we need to think about what we can do in the short term and also in the long term. I think we need to think about what we can do in the health sector, because this is a health threat, but also outside the health sector. And then many of our presenters have talked about structural factors, housing, employment, working conditions, and, and other structural factors. And I think we, we, we need to talk about how we're addressing those. Now, again, my point here isn't to go through all of these, but in the short term, I think one of the things that comes out of our study is that we need to protect people from occupational exposure to COVID-19. You know, we know that essential workers are at, are at um, heightened risk, and we also know that um, President Trump deployed the Defense Production Act to essentially compel meat packers, um, or people working at meat packing plants to go back to work. And so um, that really um, requires all of us as a nation and, and as communities to do more to just protect the health of, of people who are occupationally exposed. We need to um, protect testing access for Latinos. You know, early on when we were working on the first paper with black Americans, we were seeing, you know, emerging results where, and I, I remember it was a, an epidemiologist in, in Philadelphia, they quickly set up testing sites, but of course there was a six to one ratio that most of the, um, the testing sites were in high income zip codes versus low income zip codes. You know, that's really outrageous. And I just think we need to focus on um, how we're creating opportunities for all people, but specifically Latinos to, to, to be tested for COVID-19. Similarly, we, we uh, have to think about how we're protecting healthcare access. Now I'll speak in a minute about longer term things, but in the short term right now during this immediate crisis, we need to be thinking about both nationally at the state level and at the local level, how we're giving Latinos access to healthcare they need. I think many of us have been, um, I don't know if surprised is the right word because I feel like half of you would say, well, I wasn't surprised, but like if you watch the news, uh, one of the things that's striking is the level of food insecurity we're immediately seeing with COVID-19. Not the fact that people need assistance with, with food, but the, the, the volume or the level or percentage of people in communities that where they're very quickly just don't have enough um, adequate nutrition for their family. So that's an important thing we need to do. But you know, we're also moving into a new phase. There's been a lot of talk about how we go, help kids go back to school and, and um, adopt to virtual learning or in some cases, um, sending people back. Well, how are we supporting um, 
all families, but how are we supporting Latino families to, to, to make that transition? And then the last short term thing I'd say, and you know, um, a couple of our presenters, but I know Carlos spoke of this. Our study approach wasn't ideal. Our, what our study approach was, what we could do in real time to give us actionable policy information. But that's because we don't have adequate surveillance information, case report data based on race ethnicity. We need to fix that. So in the longer term, we can bolster our surveillance system, but right now we need to start collecting um, information, um, not just on race, ethnicity, but gender and, and, and other factors. We need to do that. Now moving to the, the longer term, um, again, health, health coverage and health access is really important. All states need to expand um, Medicaid. We heard at the top the exciting news that the voters of Missouri last night or yesterday voted to expand Medicaid. We need to get all states there. Now, I know that for um, some um, immigrants, that, that's not really helpful. But as we know, most Latinos um, are, are citizens, and I think the Latino community really disproportionately benefits directly from Medicaid expansion. But also states that expand Medicaid have healthier health systems and are able to do more with their other healthcare resources once they've expanded Medicaid. So that's got to be a, a really high priority um, issue that we address. There's also barriers to access to healthcare for immigrants. And again, my point here isn't to go through the specifics, but we know there's a bar for uh, many documented um, immigrants, le legal immigrants, from accessing Medicaid or CHIP for the first five years. We need to address um, some of these issues, but COVID-19 is also showing us that there's public health reasons why we need to get every person in the United States covered with health coverage. You know, so we need to address some of those. Um, we need to address um, housing. Um, Stability and you know some of the data that we're presenting are about the you know the the housing density. You know if we had um, better housing access, some of these problems could be mitig mitigated. You know um, we we've spoken about occupational exposures, but I think many people recognize that the United States needs to join um, much much of the rest of the world and extend paid sick leave for people. You know, our uh, crisis probably would have um, not been quite as acute as if people when they um, thought they were exposed or started feeling sick, could uh, take paid sick leave. You know, I want to move a little broader and just say some things. Um, I'm not Latino, so I'm not telling you what these are, but I also think we need to think about long-term how we deploy Latino cultural assets to respond and, and bolster our communities. You know, we, I always hear about the important role of families. So how can we better support families to, to, to support um, communities? And also, you know, I know that different communities in the United States have different experiences, whether it's with systemic racism, dealing with the health system, and there's a fundamental issue of trust. So I think we also need to be having conversations now about how we can bolster trust so that Latinos, Latino communities can feel that they can, can trust whether it's public health experts or, or others. And these, this is part of our, our long-term challenge. Now, and by just saying that like, if only this study could tell us some things and then we could say, it'll be taken care of. We provided the data, this is what we need to do. And I think there's lots of reasons why policymakers want to say, oh, we're responding for everybody. We don't have time to, to go down and do this for this group, this for that group. But what we've seen, I mentioned the example of testing sites. We can't just trust that by giving data about disparate impact on Latinos, that policymakers or others will respond appropriately. We need to make that happen. So I think this group, um, is, is a great group to start here and to, to continue this work of just raising um, the volume on the urgency of responding to the, the COVID-19 pandemic within the Latino community. But, you know, my work in HIV has really been about, you know, saying things that, you know, we all sink or swim together. We're all in this together. So it's not just on the Latino community. So I think, for example, the HIV community, we have more to do to contribute to this fight. But my, my point in closing is just really, it's, it's, it's on all of us. And there's a lot we need to do in the long term, but there's a lot we need to do right now to, to bolster Latino communities. And with that, I'll stop and turn it back over to um, Carlos. Thank you. I think now we have time to address Q and A's. Um, so, Judith, I'll, I'll follow you on this one. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so, give me one second. It looks like... Okay, great. Can you all see my screen? Yes. 
<laughs> okay, great. So thank you so much to our panelists. This was incredibly informative and I know folks have been adding questions into the chat function and our panelists are so amazing that they've been responding to many of you in real time. Um, but we do have some time uh, for questions. And before we get to that question section, I did want to thank some of our sponsors and friends and folks who have collaborated with us um, and folks who collaborated um, and the folks on, on our panel. So I wanted to give a quick thank you there. Um, but I know that there were some questions in the chat function and I'll start with some that I was able to jot down quickly. And one of them was, were you all able to take into account state policies and how that was impacting COVID? Carlos, did you want to take that one? Sorry, I, I couldn't hear. And um, are you following the questions in the Q&A or? No. Oh, okay. So, so can you repeat the question? Sure. <laughs> sure. Um, the, the question was, um, there was a question in the chat function where someone was asking if state policies were sort of taken into account and when analyzing some of the data in state by state. No, so we use national data, not specific um, state policies. Um, and so that's, that's the answer. However, um, we can help states in making sense of how this means something at the state level, um, particularly because there are some, so many specific um, issues at the policy, but also at the population level that will require a very closer look to acknowledge uh, and, and document how the pandemic is affecting at the, at the state level. But I also invite Greg and Jeff um, to, to share their thoughts in terms of the usefulness of, of these findings for, at the state level. Sure, so, um, so I, I, I agree with Carlos that you know, the data that we looked at um, did not look specifically at state policies, but we've been able to share the data because it's national data with um, senators as well as congressional officials on Capitol Hill to talk about what some of the national policies and implications are of these data. Um, the other thing though, is that the website that I shared with you, that is just the, a small part of a larger website where we do look at policies at the state level that are policies that are associated with HIV. Um, and, and, and you can go to different states and take a look how some of these policies might be affecting um, not only HIV prevalence, but COVID prevalence, et cetera. So we look at uninsurance, we look at Medicaid expansion, uh, we look at um, a number of people who are being um, uh, taken up by ICE. We look at many different things and you could take a look at all of that at the state level um, and some of it, if it's available at the county level. So you just, you know, look at the larger uh, database on ending the HIV epidemic where more of that context at the policy at the state level is there. And all of those data are downloadable. So if you wanted to download it, um, all of that information is, is already there at your fingertips. Great, thank you. And I would like to also add that I saw on a comment in, on the chat about um, creating an executive summary of our study. We are working on that and we will make sure to have an executive summary um, available very soon so you can use it uh, at your local or national or state level. And um, as Greg mentioned, we are also um, having similar conversations as this forum what with policymakers and in different with different groups uh, with the hopes of making the scientific knowledge available for decision making and advocating for the needs of our communities. Wonderful, thank you. And then we have a few more questions um, in our Q&A function. Um, one of the questions is, coronavirus hits older adults harder than other age groups. Latinos are a relatively young community um, with a median age of 28. Could the effects of COVID-19 have been worse among Latinos if the median age were higher? I would say that just using that information, which um, it's, it's accurate, it's very likely that the fact that the Latino community is younger when compared with other racial and ethnic groups has been a protective factor, but that uh, we need to also consider the quality of uh, life, uh, the pre-existing conditions, access to health care. So I don't think it's a direct association uh, between age and COVID infections and COVID deaths, but definitely it's something that could have 
could it been or is helping to see not so bad num or worse numbers um, in uh, Latino communities in, in the continental US. Um, I would say though, um, and Melissa, you can help here. Um, in Puerto Rico, we uh, the, most of the cases are happening among older men. So I think that that's also a kind of an indicator, a reflection of when you have a population that is mostly Latinos, you will see uh, what we've seen as a trend globally that is um, that deaths are mostly reported among older people. Yeah, I just want to to add, Carlos, that for example, but in the in the last month in July, we with the preliminary data, we have seen that uh, age groups um, from the 20 to 29 years old, there were the more incidents group the last month. So that's an important thing also to e evaluate for the next weeks. You know, I have this hypothesis, hypothesis that maybe that can have like a other impact in other age groups for the next um, several weeks. So that's, this is something that we need um, to, to see more in detail. Great, thank you so much. Um, there was another question about um, citizenship and, and why, um, was citizenship and country of birth of Latinos not included in the analysis? Um, the comment mentions that those are critical social determinants of health for this population. And we totally agree. We wish we had better data sources that have reliable information on that regard. Unfortunately, we don't. Um, we, um, and, and the fact is that we had different sources of information of national data but not all the sources of information capture the same data. Um, it was part of our plan to look at those variables, but unfortunately, we don't have reliable data on, on citizenship. And when we look at country of origin, um, we had a disproportionate rate of people from different groups, but we also know that it was not reliable because of the data sources and that uh, it was unable, we were unable to match uh, to the level that we needed in order to answer the questions accurately. But we acknowledge that that is a huge uh, limitation. And we know that very likely for people who are um, not documented, um, the experience of the pandemic is completely um, different from what we are uh, broadly discussing. And even within the Latino communities, there will be some com um, commonalities, but there are some differences that definitely were not necessarily captured in this study. Great, thank you. And I, there's similarly another question regarding demographic data. Um, you all mentioned that the study included migrant seasonal farm workers. And um, if they were included, what, what, what number of migrant seasonal workers were included and what risk factors in the area affected? So, we, we don't have um, the specific um, employment, uh, or I should say jobs that were described among those who were employed in our uh, data sets. However, we can look at the data and the distribution of where the jobs in, the, uh, in different industries are, and that help us as a proxy to make some um, generalizations and descriptions of certain um, work environments that might be more conductive to risk. And in fact, uh, our finding was, it's very consistent with a finding from the CDC in a report that they published almost three days before ours, um, in which they uh, did a, an, 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 sorry, an analysis among um, uh, workers in the meatpacking industry um, mid packaging industry, sorry, and they this, they described that most of the workers were Latinos. And when we look at the data from our study in the Midwest, uh, it's very consistent that we see more infections and deaths in that region among Latinos when compared to other groups. And that occupational risk was also um, associated to more cases and and deaths. Greg, I don't know if you want to add something else about that. 
No, I, I think that everything you said is, is spot on. I, I think one of the biggest issues that we uh, take a look at when we look at migrant and seasonal farm workers is that, um, you know, the way that um, the U.S. data are associated with these communities is that they're essentially invisible, unfortunately. Um, so that was definitely something that we wanted to take a look at, but it's very hard to get data that would correspond down to the county level of what's taking place with um, uh, migrant and seasonal farm workers. But we already know that there are major issues there. Um, there was a, a paper that Johns Hopkins published while we were publishing our paper um, in Baltimore where they did see um, a larger proportion of um, migrant workers who are coming in for COVID-19 cases, far higher than any other race or ethnicity or group, um, and uh, Latino farm workers. And, and that was something that they published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And there's some others that are publishing some of these discrete data as well. The problem though is that we just don't have national data on it, as well as national data down to the county level. And, and that's what we needed for our analyses. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question around risk factors, and this one is specifically about air pollution and crowded housing and the differential effect it has on the Latino, Latina, Latinx population. So if you all could share a little bit more about that. Crowded housing and air pollution? Yes. Yeah, so um, crowded housing, um, what we know of crowded housing in the Latino communities is that we often have households with multiple um, families living in um, because it's part of the experience of migration, it's part of some cultural practices. They have, people may have different explanations, but we have documented that in the past. Um, one of the challenges that we've been seeing in the response to the pandemic is that often in, house, in um, households with um, many people living in and people having to go out and work, some people are staying in. We have multiple generations of people in the house, meaning that we have from kids to elders in, in, in the same physical space. The in and out of people that have to go to work increases the risk of bringing, of getting infected out of the home, but bringing the infection home. And um, also when you have too many people in one space, even when you're following some practices like quarantine or staying away from others because you have been exposed or um, you just got tested and that was a recommendation. Some families cannot do that because they don't have the physical space to do that. Um, and air pollution has been associated with um, respiratory conditions that um, exacerbate the disease progression when the person is infected. And um, air pollution, unfortunately, has been documented uh, in the communities and physical um, spaces where communities of colors live. Um, and there are different reasons for that. In some cases, it's because um, communities of color, including Latinos, are living in metropolitan areas where you have more air pollution because of transportation and other industries. And then, you know, the rural areas has to do with um, industries that are there. Um, let's see the case of, of Texas and the coast or other um, parts of the states where you have refineries and um, industries that are constantly polluting the air and that air um, remains very close to where communities live, and that increased risk um, for uh, disease progression once a person is infected. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question about whether you all were able to evaluate, um, you know, if providers were providing um, intubation or the discretion of intubating a patient um, and related to deaths with COVID and the Latinx population? Um, no, our study does not include um, data on hospitalization or any procedure at hospital with the population. Great, thank you. And we have a lot of questions. <laughs> well. I can help um, and, and the team can help uh, if you have seen any specific questions that you'd like to address. Um, I think, well, we have another question where the question is, while doing your research, did you find information about attitudes of Latinos towards immunization, vaccines, or some other data that we could use to reference maybe some future um, work um, and, and how we can prepare communities, right, for the vaccine trials and, and, and what we perceive to happen in, in the future? 
So we don't have data on immunization or vaccines or attitudes toward vaccine in our communities. However, um, the good news is that while we were working on this project, on this study, um, NIH was funding the uh, COVPN or the network for the COVID vaccine studies. Um, in, in fact, some of the co-authors of the paper are part of the uh, senior research uh, group uh, on this network, and uh, they are very aware of the findings of our study to the point that now for the COVPN, they have created uh, groups um, to support the development of information um, for the communities um, regarding the studies and the clinical trials for vaccines, and also to ensure that the clinical trials take into consideration the diversities uh, and the experiences of our communities when participating in clinical trials. Um, now, I'm, I'm fortunate now to, to be part of one of those teams, and I think that Greg is also part of, of the teams that are supporting the COVPN in informing the trials that are, are going to be rolled out for the vaccine. Great, thank you. But can and, I just... Mm -hmm. Can okay. I jump? So just to expand on that, and I also saw in the chat there was a question about, you know, um, something someone said that since Latino culture is heavily family oriented, has there been any focus or recommendations on how relatives can maintain strong emotional ties? And you know, it's a much longer comment. I just want to like sort of step back and 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 I actually think these types of questions are really important, but our study wasn't designed to do this. Um, when I step back from like a, a very high level, we first started seeing these disparities for Black Americans, but Latino Americans, Native Americans. I think some people said, oh, but they're just antidotes. How do you know they're real? And I think what our study was able to do is really document that they're real, but we weren't taking on like solving the COVID-19 pandemic for Latino communities. And when I look even at the, the range of sponsors of this, this webinar and others, these are all things we have to do. But you know, I certainly am not the person to talk to you about or, or recommend to you how to engage families, but we need to do this. And um, and, I, and I'm afraid when I say this, I hope that you don't hear me being dismissive of that. We, we need to do this by, I look at early in the, in the pandemic, um, there are questions about safe sex, you know, and a number of health departments or organizations came up with safe sex guidelines. Then you saw safe sex guidelines or re recommendations for um, gay and bisexual men and, and other communities. We need to do all of these things, but again, it's not really a, what our research team can take on, but I think collectively, and I also want to empower people to say, we don't need a research study to back up everything we need to do. We're in a crisis response. And many of you are so well situated in your communities, you know how to, to give messages that are helpful and you could convey things better than, than, than many of us can. So I just hope what you hear is that there's, there's probably more questions that we can answer, but I hope you all go away saying, there's so much we all need to do and we just need to start doing it. Thank you. That is very helpful, I think, to hear and to know that um, this was a study that happened early on and, and what COVID looks like today, um, just with the rapid changes in, in where um, the virus is now. And, um, you know, I think in some of the earlier slides you shared, it had the South sort of with a flat line, and we've seen those increases as well nationally. Um, so that brings me to a question with, with, with COVID changing and these numbers changing um, and looking at where um, COVID is today, what are some next steps for, for you all in terms of the study? Do you all anticipate updating some of these results, re-looking at this in a few months? Well, I think... Um... We will probably have um, enough data, perhaps better data, to do something similar, not the same, mm -hmm. uh, very soon. However, I personally, I will collaborate with, with this team anytime to do the research that we need to do to inform the work that we can do in our communities and to inform policies. But um, I am now trying to look uh, to how we can trans, that the findings are probably going to be very similar. So what do we do with these findings to actually change the conditions that are affecting our community? 
personally, that's where my focus is. Uh, in part, doing research with more specific communities. So for example, I am doing research now with populations affected by HIV, and I'm doing research in Puerto Rico, uh, also collaborating research with LGBT populations and research with uh, recently migrant um, populations in the DMV area. So to me, that's a way of using the findings from this study to take a closer look to those issues and populations that are disproportionately affected within the Latino community so we can move faster to solutions. Um, that would be my first step uh, and probably not a response to your question, but a way of framing the, the research that we need, um, but also to, to do more action research, work with the communities that are already doing something um, and evaluate what is working. Uh, use some implementation science to expand good practices very fast. That's what we need um, because otherwise we will keep, keep describing problems that we know are affecting our communities. Yeah, I, I would not speak for my colleagues. <laughs> no, you, well, I completely agree with you, Carlos. I, you know, we know that the disparities are going to be there. They've always been there. They're going to continue to be there. They're not just disparities for uh, COVID-19. We see the same disparities for HIV. We see the same disparities even for other respiratory illnesses like swine flu that we had back a decade ago, which is similar to COVID-19, where we saw Latinx communities are more likely to be hospitalized. So, you know, we really don't need to keep documenting the disparities or writing papers around it. And I think that that's part of the reason why we have the website and the dashboard that's available because that continues to track what's taking place in Latino counties compared to all other counties in real time. So you could see that these disparities are continuing. But we do need to move forward on, you know, what are some of the policy implications? What are some of the other things that we could do to actually reduce these disparities and to help these communities that are at higher risk for COVID-19? Great, thank you. Um, we have a question in our chat function and it is, what are the key recommendations for health departments in areas with dense Latinx populations, especially in the South and Puerto Rico? Can you give an example of community-driven um, interventions to improve solutions? Yeah, I think that we all can have uh, a recommendation here. I'll start with mine. Um, I think that departments of health should work closely or closer with Latino serving organizations. Um, mm -hmm. They have the experience of providing services that are culturally congruent to our, to our communities, and they should have the resources to continue providing services. They know how to disseminate information, health education information for prevention, how to uh, implement um, testing if necessary, or how to help people navigate the healthcare systems in a way that um, expedite the process for our communities. That would be my, my, my call for Departments of Health. Great. Could, could I um, jump in on that? One of the things that we sort of collectively realized we need to do is build a system to do contact tracing for um, COVID-19. and. Um, I've done a little bit of work about this, but just saying that we, um, you know, th there's important roles and functions of contact tracing that must be performed at health departments, but all the work doesn't need to happen with health departments. And I think that the strongest programs are those that integrate community partners, community-based organizations that have deep roots in communities and can do a lot of this, the, um, the groundwork. They're the ones that have trust in communities. So I would encourage health departments to explore um, partnerships, both with existing um, community-based partners and others, not only for contact tracing, but to do education and other forms of, of COVID response. Great, thank you. And Dr. Melissa Marzan, would, would you say similarly yeah, sure. for, for Puerto Rico? Yeah, sure. I think one of the things for Puerto Rico in a specific, we are also are facing others um, public health emergencies as well, because for example, we have the situation of the earthquakes in the southwest area of Puerto Rico, and um, we also are in the hurricane season. So we are having so many challenges right now, and basically I, I agree with all, all of my colleagues, but for sure what we need to do very specific, very strategic, is to do community um, educational interventions. There are so many people who are, don't want to know anything about, they don't want to know anything about COVID. They are, really don't want to know because they are hearing about COVID since February, right? 
so we need to be more um i don't know how to say more creative in the way that we are going to um, give this information to the community and for sure i think that one of the recommendations for the puerto rico department of health is that we need to include to be inclusive with the community based organizations in puerto rico because this is the people who are always working with the community so they know their needs so they know their language so this is very important in this process just to make um the people empowered with all this COVID information Great, thank you. And then we have another question, um, but this may be a question where actually some of our participants of today's webinar can sound off in the chat function. And there's a question of, is there any data on the impact um, or involvement of COVID and local governments sort of responding to that? So if, if you live in a jurisdiction or a county where, um, where your local government has responded uh, to the Latinx population and COVID. Please share that in the chat function. Um, and then how can we support efforts to mobilize our base to support this process of, of using this data for, for advocacy and some mobilization with local government and state and federal? So those are all things that. Yeah, so in terms of research with um, governments or leaders in Latino communities, I am not aware of that kind of research. I do know of a colleague who's doing some research among stakeholders, but that's not necessarily what this question is all about. Um, I don't know if my colleagues in the team knows a little bit more about that, but it's a good idea. <laughs> and and yes, I think I would appreciate uh, the input uh, of the uh, of those in the audience in terms of how we can make this information useful um, for decision makers. Um, and I want to tie that to a question here that I want to find again. Uh, you know, how we can use the findings from the study to mobilize and, and, and get some actions. I have some thoughts about that. Um, so something that I'm very proud of the result of all this work and the study is that um, something that I've seen in other communities in the past, uh, we might have an opportunity to do now. Um, as a Latino man in the or perceived as a latino man in the united states a person who self-identifies as puerto rican my first language is spanish um i i am glad that i'm able to work with others who have provided for us to do this research but that also we can present the research to our communities um, i would like to see more people like myself advocating for our health and using science to inform policy actions. So I will encourage community leaders, those of you here in the, in the session, to um, you know, email us if you need more information, but use these research findings to advocate. Um, because as a member of a community and a research that is, that is being led by uh, members of our community, this is, this is a great tool. I will also um, advocate to make sure that we create visibility in media. Um, media is driving the discourse. I mean, we know that we have policymakers that are um, using their position of power with very complicated and difficult messages to our communities. But um, if you are asked by media or if you have some ways of communicating with your local media, please make yourself available and speak on, on media and make sure that your communities can see you, can see ourselves talking about the, the findings from our work. Um, and I'm not only talking about the study, the study should be useful to you, but also the work that you are doing from your organizations and from your um, specific locations. I think that that's very important. And also, um, we can help in, in, in any way possible to 
craft messages to policymakers that could be at the county level or at the state level. Of course, at the national level, we're trying to engage in that communication. Um, but I think those are important things that we can do now because it has an influence on the current discourse and we need to take actions now um, to, to see changes in the pandemic. Otherwise, we're gonna keep seeing on the unfortunate numbers that we're seeing uh, because we don't have the uh, political structure with the will to make the changes that are necessary. So we have to advocate and push for those changes um, and, in, and in order to see uh, an impact at the local and then state and national level. Great, thank you. And we have some questions around, I think there's some concerns about, you know, children returning to school and, and what changes that will bring, uh, particularly in, in multi-generational housing um, and, and how this can be impacted. Um, so I'll ask participants, as well as if any of our panelists have any comments um, to share some strategies that they're thinking of implementing in their own communities or if they've heard about. Um, so I invite folks to share about that as well. So um, I will jump in, but I don't have an answer for this. I would just <laughs> make an observation that um, our country's struggling with this. You know, every night you hear the news, there's new debates. Some people, some parents believe kids need to be in schools. Other parents and teachers believe it's too dangerous. Um, there's a million different approaches. And I just think, you know, if only we had clear answers right now. So in some ways we're, we're all muddling through, but I also believe that um, there are unique barriers and challenges, but also there's unique assets and opportunities that, that different parts of our communities bring. And we need to make sure they're bringing thoughtfulness, engagement to this debate. And with the idea that like, we all care about certain things. We all care, we want our communities to be healthy. We want our kids to learn. We don't want them scarred by, by, by this pandemic period. Um, and we just need to recognize we all don't have the answers. I don't think our research teams are the right ones to recommend how to make it safe to go to school. Also, as someone that's been in policy roles before, I would say, I hope people understand you shouldn't be demanding certainty where nothing changes now because the facts keep unfolding and they keep changing. So I think we all need to be flexible and realize whatever we do, it won't be perfect. But I also think that it's in these, these times that if people sit back and they wait for the answer, then they're really upset because their views or their needs aren't, aren't taken. So I just think part of what we collectively need to do is strategize for, for how we can bring forward more, more voices into these debates about schools or other things. Because we know, as, as you know, Carlos was talking about the role of media, there are certain people that are very good about getting their views you know, heard in the media. How do we get other view, views um, heard, whether it's the media, at school board hearings, or other sessions? So that we can um, grapple or you know muddle, muddle our ways to the the best response. And my last point on this is, as with so many of these complex issues, the right answer is going to be local. You know, we can't say the right answer for the United States looks like this. It will be very uh, state, local, community, neighborhood specific. Great, thank you. And I think um, you know, in looking and reading and sharing some of the questions, I think it's evident that. We need to have more spaces to sort of come together and discuss some of these um, strategies that some folks are implementing, resources available, um, advocacy strategies around COVID. Um, and um, it looks like we are about out of time, but I still invite folks to continue to add resources and information in the chat function uh, for folks from across the country to sort of learn more about. I want to thank our panelists. Um, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram, um, as well as find our other webinars and other um, information on our YouTube channel or on our website. For more information regarding all of this, um, or if you have questions, if you need more resources from today's webinar, please feel free to contact Luis Mares. His email is below. But I really want to thank everyone who participated for such a lively and active discussion. Um, this meeting was recorded and everyone will receive a copy of the presentation. So we'll have all of those things available. Um, so I appreciate everyone joining today. Thank you so much.
Thank you, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.